In this video, I want to talk about the ideal gas equation. So it's right here, it's PV equals NRT. P stands for pressure, and you can use any units you'd like for pressure as long as they match with everything else in your equation. V stands for volume, and again, you can use any units you want so long as everything at the end matches up on both sides of the equal sign in terms of units. N is the number of moles of gas you have. R is the ideal gas constant, and this is a constant, so of course it doesn't change. And there are many different forms of it depending on the units that you need to match up with everything else in your equation. And T, finally, is the temperature, and this has to be in Kelvin. So you can derive a number of laws from PV equals NRT. Boyle's law, Charles' law, Guy Lussac's law, and Avogadro's law. And these are pretty useful for solving a lot of word problems that you'll see in chemistry. And each one of them basically looks at two variables from the PV equals NRT equation and assumes everything else is held constant and sees how those variables change with one another. So Boyle's law looks at pressure and volume. And a good way you can remember this is imagine some guy has a boil on his face. He'd be pretty peeved about that, right? So you can think about PV kind of sounds like peeved. So if someone had a boil on their face, they would be peeved. So this says the initial pressure times the volume for a gas has to be equal to the final pressure and volume uh, multiplied together of a gas assuming all the other variables are held constant. So like number of moles would be held constant and the temperature would have to be held constant. And graphically it looks like this, where the pressure is on the y-axis, the volume is on the x-axis, and you can see that since they're multiplied together to make a constant, they have to increase while the other one decreases and vice versa. So when pressure goes up, look what happens to volume. It goes down. When volume goes up, pressure goes down. So they're inversely related. Charles' law looks at volume and temperature, and a way that you can remember this is Charlie's Angels on the TV. So TV, just remember T is in the denominator, and it tells you that the initial volume divided by the initial temperature has to be equal to the final volume divided by the final temperature. And graphically, it looks like this. So since they're a fraction, they're directly proportional. They're directly related, and they're gonna go up with one another. So when volume increases, the temperature has to increase, and vice versa. And that makes sense, right? Because it's a fraction. When the numerator gets bigger, the denominator has to get bigger if we want that fraction to remain the same value. Okay, Guy Lussac's law. So a way you can remember this one, this isn't the most uh, politically correct, but imagine there's some man that all these women are attracted to and then they find out that the man is gay. So you can think about, they would think that that is a pity. So PT, that's how you remember that. I got that from my high school chemistry teacher, so I gotta give credit where credit is due. I still remember it six years later. So this says that the initial pressure divided by the initial temperature is equal to the final pressure divided by the final temperature. And graphically, this looks the same as Charles' law, except instead of volume, you have pressure on the y-axis here. So again, they're directly proportional. They go up with one another, and they also decrease with one another. Finally, Avogadro's law says that the initial volume divided by the initial number of moles is equal to the final volume divided by the final number of moles. And the way that I remember this is Avogadro kind of looks like avocado, right? And avocados are very nutritious. So hopefully that helps you out. And you can see the graphical relationship is again, it's a fraction, so it's a directly proportional relationship with volume on the y-axis, number of moles on the x-axis. And finally, if you have a problem where you're dealing with a change in pressure, volume, and temperature, you can use the combined gas law. And the way I remember this one is peas and vegetables on the table. So hopefully this helps you remember the gas laws and we will see how these are used in problems next. All right, so in number one, a gas occupies a volume of 795 milliliters at 450 millimeters of mercury. Part A asks you to find the new volume if the pressure changes to 3.5 bar. So think about what happened here. We had an initial volume and an initial pressure and now they're asking us to find a new volume with a new pressure. So it sounds like we're dealing with an initial pressure and volume and a final pressure and volume. So clearly this is gonna be Boyle's law. P1V1 equals P2V2. So the only problem here is that our units don't match on both sides of the equal sign. Whenever you're doing a gas law problem, you have to make sure your units are the same on both sides of the equal sign. So what you can do is either change the millimeters of mercury to bar or the bar to millimeters of mercury. In this case, I changed 3.5 bar to millimeters of mercury. 
And you can see I did the conversion right here and I used the conversion uh, values that I have at the bottom of the board here. You can see that in 760 millimeters of mercury, I have 1.01325 bar. And I put bar on bottom here and millimeters of mercury on top since I want to go to millimeters of mercury and I'm leaving bar. And I found that in 3.5 bar, there is 2,625.22 millimeters of mercury. And then I was able to plug that in to my final pressure here, P2. And of course my P1 was 450 millimeters of mercury. V1 was 795 milliliters. And this is just a very simple algebra problem at this point. You solve for V2 and you end up with 136.27 milliliters. So that is your new volume once the pressure changes to 3.5 bar. Okay, moving on to part B, find the new volume if the pressure changes to 30 kilopascals. So again, we started out with an initial volume and initial pressure. They want the new volume with the new pressure. So again, Boyle's Law. We just want to get more practice converting between units here. Because again, they really have to match on both sides of the equal sign. Otherwise, you get the answer wrong. And in this case, we had kilopascals. So we started out with 30 kilopascals. So I went ahead and changed that to millimeters of mercury, just like we did last time. And so I started out with the 30 kilopascals and I found that in 760 millimeters of mercury, there are 101.325 kilopascals. And using this conversion, I was able to find that there are 225.02 millimeters of mercury in 30 kilopascals. I went ahead and plugged this into my P2, my final pressure, in the same units that I had on the other side of the equation. And again, at this point, it's a very simple algebra problem. You solve for the final volume. And in this case, it's 1,589.9 milliliters. So let's look back at our answers and see if they make sense. So we know with Boyle's law, pressure and volume are inversely related. And that means that when pressure goes up, volume goes down. When volume goes up, pressure goes down. Of course, this is assuming temperature and all the other variables are constant. So in the first problem, we had 450 millimeters of mercury of pressure to begin with, and then it went way up to 2,625.22 millimeters of mercury. So when the pressure goes up, what would we expect to happen to the volume? Well, we would expect it to go down, and that's what happened, right? It went from 795 to 136.27. In the second problem, we started out with 450 millimeters of mercury of pressure, and then what happened? We went down to 225.02 millimeters of mercury of pressure. When you go down in pressure, you actually expect volume to increase, and that's what happened. We started at 795 milliliters, and we ended up with 1,589.9 milliliters. So always kind of look back and make sure your answer actually makes sense considering what this law means. Okay, let's do some more. So if 12 liters of H2 gas are at negative 15 degrees Fahrenheit, find the new volume if the temperature changes to A, 15 degrees Celsius, and B, 312 degrees Kelvin. So let's start with A. So let's think about what they're asking here. They're asking if we start with an initial volume and an initial temperature, they want a final volume and they give us a final temperature. So this sounds like Charles' law, right? V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. It allows us to plug in an initial volume and temperature and then find a final volume and temperature. The problem is again, our units don't match. So we started out with liters and degrees Fahrenheit. We ended with degrees Celsius. We know with Charles' law, we have to use Kelvin for temperature because it comes from the ideal gas law and the T in PV equals NRT always has to be in Kelvin. So the liters are fine, but we're gonna have to change the temperature to Kelvin. So you can see over here, I have how to change Fahrenheit to Kelvin and then Celsius to Kelvin. It's a lot easier to change Celsius to Kelvin. Fahrenheit to Kelvin is a little bit more of a tricky formula. It's right here. It says Kelvin is equal to the degrees Fahrenheit plus 459.67 times 5 ninths. So I went ahead and changed negative 15 degrees Fahrenheit to Kelvin and I found that it was 247.04 Kelvin. So this is going to be my T1, my initial temperature, and that's why I plugged it in right here, and this was under the initial volume, 12 liters. And again, we're solving for the final volume, V2, so I left out a variable, and I wanted the final temperature again in Kelvin. So 15 degrees Celsius is our final temperature, and I'm gonna change that to Kelvin by adding 273.15. So 15 plus 273.15 gives us 288.15 Kelvin. That's my T2. 
And then what I do from here is just solve for V2 and I find that the final volume is 14 liters. And again, let's make sure this makes sense. So we know volume and temperature are directly related. When one goes up, the other goes up. When one goes down, the other goes down. So in this case, what happened to temperature? It went from 247.04 to 288.15. So if temperature went up, we would expect volume to also go up. And it did, it went from 12 liters to 14 liters. So it checks out with Charles Law. Okay, part B. What if we went to 312 Kelvin? So luckily we're already given Kelvin in this case. So we started with 12 liters and negative 15 degrees Fahrenheit. And now we're going to a new volume with 312 Kelvin. So again, it's Charles law. We're solving for V2. Our initial conditions are the exact same as the last time, 12 liters. And then we already found the temperature in Kelvin of 15 degree, negative 15 degrees Fahrenheit. We're solving for V2. We put it over our 312 Kelvin because that's already in Kelvin. Solve for V2 and you get 15.2 liters as your final volume. So let's make sure this makes sense. So temperature in this case, again, went up. So volume should have gone up. And temperature actually went up even more this time. Last time it went from 247 to 288. This time it went from 247 to 312. So we would probably expect a volume even bigger than 14 liters. And that's what we got, right? 15.2 liters. So I hope you can see now that these ideal gas law problems aren't very difficult. You just have to make sure you're using the correct units. That's usually how they make it difficult. Um, but if this helped you out, please give it a thumbs up, share it with a friend, and I'll see you guys in the next video.